So we grew up knowing that we're nothing. And that was a very important strategy for the Zionist government to keep us on the unknown, but also to keep us divided from the rest of the Arab world. So for the Arab world would think that we are just Israelis. And uh, so this way the divide and conquer strategy worked to a point where a lot of people really thought that we are just Israelis. Welcome to Afikra's Quarter Tones. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on this series, we have Suhail Nafar from the iconic Palestinian rap group, Dam. Suhail is also the head of Empire Records, Wana, as well as the music supervisor of the show Mo on Netflix. And he's done many, many other things. Suhail, welcome to Afikra. Yeah, hello. Thanks man. for having me, man. It, it's so good to have you on the series. We've been trying to get this to happen for a long time, and I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have you on. Um, you wear many hats, many, many hats. Do you think of yourself first and foremost as rapper, musician, artist, member of DAM? Um, I think I think it's a big part of me, of my personality, of my character, of who I am. And in the when I joined, I was 14 years old when we started yeah. DAM. And so that's built who I am, the way I'm working at Empire, the way I worked on Mo, the way I worked at Spotify. I had them um, like on my back or my knowledge. Uh, and yeah. the reason I spoke, speak English is because, you know, damn, uh, we all liked American hip hop. So that's the reason hip hop is the reason why I learned English. I'm yeah. no longer part of damn, but still like damn, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's a learning, learning Tupac records off All Eyes on Me. Me and me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk about your childhood. I told you this before, right? Um, I, I came across your music in the early 2000s. Um, and it wasn't until recently that I realized that where you grew up was a, is a very specific part of Palestine. Um, and is a neighborhood and a town that is notorious. Um, so like, first of all, tell us where this town is and what makes it such a dangerous place to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, Lid, Lidda, Lud, Lud, you know, it has, has, has many names. Mm -hmm. I like to call it the Lidda. Um, Lidda was one of the almost last cities that uh, fell under the occupation, had the very good fighters in, in 1948. Um, recent researches are showing that Lid actually had one of the biggest mass, the biggest massacre uh, in 1948, uh, when, when the Zionist, I think it was the Palmach unit uh, the, the, that uh, occupied the city, uh, killed people in uh, Damash Mosque in the old town. Uh, back then it was, uh, you know, majority Palestinian city, just like all Palestine. And then after 1948, the occupation, a lot of immigrants, a lot of the photos that you see when you see like refugees walking, a lot of those photos, what we call Masirat uh, al-Maut uh, or is from Lid. It's when people started marching uh, when, the, when the massacre happened and they, they left Lid, they were walking to Ramallah. And, yeah. you know, I, I always remember Amti, uh, she's now, she passed away recently, but her stories are, are telling me like, you know, like I remember as a kid walking around, seeing all these bodies all around the city. I remember the march. I remember like, I was so, even though like I didn't live it, but the city, it, it's still in that city that, that the occupation or colonialist, um, killing that happened then is still living in the city somehow. But the city is geographically is between Jerusalem and uh, Yaffa, uh, yeah. almost 20 minutes, 20 minutes, more or less. Um, after the occupation, a majority, a lot, a lot of the people got uh, kicked out of the city uh, to a point where uh, today we are only 20% of the city. Uh, the city is controlled by an um, Israeli uh, uh, right wing, extreme right wing, is, uh, is the governmental control. Uh, yeah. the, the schools, uh, majority of the schools are uh, public schools that are also controlled by uh, the, the Israeli uh, government. 
Um, so the education is, you know, we growing up in the city, ed, ed, our education what has to go through the shabak first before goes to our principal or teachers. And so everything is uh, Israeli mukhabarat, uh, shabak uh, information. And so yeah. none of the stories. So we grew up n- knowing that we're nothing, and that was a very important strategy uh, for the Zionist government to keep us on the unknown, but also to keep us divided from the rest of the Arab world. So for the Arab world would think that we are just Israelis. And uh, so this way, the divide and conquer strategy worked to a point where a lot of people really thought that we are just Israelis, that, that, which for us, when, when I grew up and I started like going around, I was shocked to hear people just asking me questions. I was like, wait, do you really think that we're like fully Israelis? I was like, and then, you know, a lot of it is education, which is something that I still do till today. And it still surprised me till today, even with, in the, in the an age when we had the internet when you can research. I was reading about it and yeah. I had heard interviews you were saying, you know, this is a city that is basically felt like growing up in a ghetto. And I started doing research and it's like murder capital, you know, insane violence. Um, and I was, you know, I was wondering what that must have been like on a day-to-day basis as a teenager you know, in the nineties, in the eighties, um, what was like, the, what was it like walking to school? I mean, like, how did this actually like impact your, impact your daily life? You know, unfortunately it hasn't changed months. Yeah. I was just home visiting my family and, and my cousin got killed while I was there. I got shot eight times and, and it wasn't because of the occupation. It was uh, because of accidentally someone else. So it was targeted and he was with that. It was at the, at the right, the wrong time, um, wrong place, wrong time in the wrong car. So got shot over, I don't know, coming. Wow. eight times and eight bullets were in, in his body. And then one, they did surgery, they took all the bullets, but one was stuck in his head. And then he didn't, he didn't survive it uh, a month later. So the, and that week that my cousin got shot, there was two other people, my friends who was actually live close where this slide is, cause that's where I grew up, um, right behind the church and the mosque also got killed same, same exact week. So th- it hasn't changed much. It's still, um, still this, the, the ghetto feeling that the city have, and you know, we're like growing up at first when you don't know why this is happening you just hate yourself as a person and you hate your people like and a lot of big cliche not the bad well, it's, it's bad it's bad which some of it is, is right where we sh- like it's bad right but then after learning after learning from hip hop actually more than just my day to day and learning from hip hop that the what they call here black on black crime or why uh, latinos are getting killed and black getting killed and all that it comes from a reason and poverty is part of it and poverty it comes from a place covered poverty comes from uh, an a colonialist or um, a, you know like a get, the ghetto doesn't just come just doesn't just people don't create ghettos there's a higher power yeah that makes it into a ghetto uh, you know, the city of Lid, like historically, is a very central, even from the Ottoman days, very central for, for economics, for trades, for since it's like literally in the middle. So uh, everything from hotels, uh, from olive, from sabune, from everything, we have a lot, we had a lot of that. That's the, that's why uh, Lid, uh, the, the, the Palestine airport was in Lid as well. And, and that was before 1948. What they call today is uh, Tel Aviv Airport or Ben Gurion Airport. This is actually like seven minutes away from my house, and it's on the mm-hmm. land of Lid. They just changed the name to Tel Aviv Airport. I think just like close to like 15 years ago, it was always there. Uh, the train station, the central train station, is there. And uh, back in the Ottoman days, they were building a full river that would connect the whole Wana region through that river that would go from Lid. Uh, to Egypt, to Saudi, to like to connect us all, and then we could just like go through like uh, a boat. So but it was very central business, and uh, uh, and then that and then that turned from that to occupation, and then turned into 
and good fighters until the 80s that uh, suddenly the city had uh, collaborators that brought drugs with them and brought uh, poverty with them that worked closely with the Israeli government that turned us to what where, where we are today. And wow. ni- late 90s, like you mentioned, was the terrible time where I remember as a kid uh, going to school, seeing needles on the floor or seeing bodies on the floor. Or I remember when my brother was seven years old, um, he found uh, my friend, who's uh, our neighbor, door to door, found his body just under, under, like just leaving when he was seven. And, you know, that's, that's the type of uh, reality we saw or, you know, drug dealers it's... everywhere, drug station everywhere. And so you're being targeted by this poverty every day, but at the same time you're being targeted by the police, the Israel, which is because the Israel police is the one that is like clearing the street, but making sure that the drug stays in the Arab streets. And so that Israeli police made sure to terrorize us as well uh, from, you know, like personal story. I get, well, they, they came to my building looking for drugs. They didn't find drugs anywhere in the building. So they just decided to terrorize my brother who was 11 here. And they took both of us and they just opened the whole police station just for the two of us, locked it in. And I was just on the floor getting beat up for like an hour for by, by, by three years early militants. Right. So that's, that's the city. It's like always yeah. trying to keep you down and keep you, not, not speaking, from the education side, from the housing side, because you don't get permit to build. And if you build without permit, your house gets demolished. There's over 30,000 houses that are about to be demolished, and there's always that struggle in the city. So, so yeah, so it's like very a, a ghetto within... And an and, and open air prison, but again, not to compare it to Gaza or to the West Bank, because it's a different type of uh, occupation there. Yeah. So I want to go back to that, you know, when you guys started making music, um, you and uh, you and Tamir and Mahmoud, walk me through, like, when you guys started hitting record. You know, like mm. it's easy to make it's easy to make music with friends, right? And yeah. and uh, and family. It's like you sit around the piano, you have a guitar, you just beat on the uh, beat on the yeah. table. Somebody beatboxes, but the decision to start pressing record is a very crucial decision. Yeah. When's the first time you hit record? I would say that was Tamer. Growing up, I remember. You know, we really loved the Western culture when it comes to Michael Jackson and you know, MC Hammer, a lot of the early days of hip hop. We loved it. Yeah. Um, and Tamer was always very sharp. Uh, he was like a poet since as a kid. So like battle would have been, is, is an easy thing to Tamer. If you come say anything to him, if you're a big guy, if you come yeah. say anything to Tamer, he's like, <laughs> slice. Because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I remember, I remember as a kid, uh, we didn't have computers yet or internet. Uh, so Tamer somehow found a way to not escape to, 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 to kind of smuggle into a library yeah. uh, to find a computer to print, uh, all lyrics from a- AZ lyrics. Of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> uh, get all the lyrics of hip hop, bring it at home, and then open the trans- the encyclopedia or whatever book yeah. it was to translate word by word and then writing it down and then writing his own poem too. So I remember our room because we shared the same room in a small apartment. And I remember our, my room was like full of papers because of that. Man. Yeah, and, so funny. Um, yeah, and I told my parents, and like, this is what Tamer's doing. And my dad was like, what? It's like, I, I didn't know. And then my dad was like, he, he, my dad, I, I believe like my dad is the founder of Dam at the end of the day. Mm. He was like, we got to find a way to do something with what he's doing. So I remember him like 96, 97, driving around, trying to find some of the musicians or someone to help that skill. Cause your dad was a musician too, right? 
My dad was a musician, part of the the Nafars family, which I call the bootleg Michael, ja- the, the bootleg Jackson Five, because they were yeah. the Nafar Fifteen. Um, <laughs> five were, is not was... enough. We're about to have 15. Yeah, 15 uncles and aunts, 15 siblings, so 14 siblings. That's what my dad said, so 15. Uh, so he was, he was from a musical family. My grandfather was building Oud and Kanun and Shalatu Kamanjat and Khashab. So he was also a musician. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, were, we, were, we grew up in a music uh, mentality. Um, but yeah, so my dad was like, let me take you around. He found a producer in Yaffa. That didn't work out. Then we found a different producer. Till like, I would say it took like a year at least or two to f- hit the record. And the, the hitting the record, um, he hit the record uh, finally in studio. And I hit the record on camera, actually, not on the mic, because I was more into films. Yeah. Uh, and I had a camera. And, and then I used to do a lot of films as a kid about uh, like drug dealing or like things like that. Yeah, boy, like boys in the hood yeah but <laughs> do, documenting with really bad acting bad stripped bad dialogue yeah, yeah, yeah. just this kid and so i documented him in the studio and then he was like you know just you do the hook so i went in i did the hook and then i was in that environment oh, cool. of music for 14 years old till i was 30. i want to play a a clip from The Dams YouTube page, right? Dams like official yeah. YouTube page. This clip, I think, is like 15 years old or 16 years old. Um, so for those listening to the podcast, uh, so hey, tell, just tell us what we're about to listen to. <laughs> Here's what I remember here. We were on the way to a show in the north, I think, maybe in Haifa. And next to me, it's Mahmoud Jreri. Tamer is driving. I'm not sure we're sitting on the front, but then Abed uh, Daadli, who's like the main sound engineer of every musician you could think of coming to the region, he's one of the best out there. Uh, and then I was like, hey, let's just do that, because I always like to play around with the camera. Yeah. And then we just started jamming. And yeah. I love this clip. I'm so happy that you guys don't have it unlisted and that you have it available to watch. It's so funny. But it's so joyful. Like you guys are just kids having fun. You know, yeah. Uh, honestly, if you if you look at it, those are my like my favorite mu- moments of musicians because it's not yeah. working too hard or overthinking about heavy budget music video or anything like that. You just really this is us. This is how we would be every time we go into a show. We would be like blasting beats and screaming all the way. If it's an hour ride, it's like. us fighting in the car on who's playing the next track. Yeah. So, <laughs> so funny. Um, okay. So you guys blew up, um, globally, I will say because of this song, which yeah. you've talked about a lot. Um, I'm curious now looking back at the song, how that we're going to play it. Um, have your feelings about what the song meant? for the region changed and for everybody listening tell tell everybody what the song is mean Rahabi translated to who's the terrorist yeah um when we wrote the song emotionally it was out of anger there wasn't any thinking behind the pen really it was just like literally spitting like and if you hear my verse which is the last part, verse of yeah. the song I'm like screaming. I'm not even rapping. I'm just like literally yelling at the mic yeah, uh, with anger. Um, and that's what it was. Uh, it was actually, it was throwback because right now, as we're talking, you know, the last week uh, to the, the attack on Janine that's yeah. been happening last week, it's literally was then throwback to 2001. It was an attack on Janine as well at uh, that time. And that's, Literally, after, we wrote it right after the attack on Janine. Let's play a little bit of it. Let's play a little bit of it. Mean it happy, 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 ain't that happy, mean it happy, mean it happy, mean it happy, mean it happy. 
happy, me not happy, me not happy, me not happy, me not happy, and I'm happy. Me not happy, I'm not happy. كيف الهابي وانا عايش ببلادي مين الهابي انت الهابي ماكلني وانا عايش ببلادي قاتلني زي ما تلت اجدادي اجل الخنون عن صادي ما انت يا عدو بتلعب دور الشاهد المحامي والقاضي علي قاضي نهاية بادي حلمك ان ايه فوق معنى علي حلمك لا علي تصير بالمقابر اختارية ديمقراطية والله انكم ناسية I'm gonna play a I'm gonna play a footage from a performance and I'm gonna put on mute. The only reason why I'm putting it on mute is because this footage, the crowd is screaming their heads off, okay? Um, I found this, this is like a bootleg recording on YouTube, right? Of you guys performing mm -hmm. this live. Um, and- I've never seen that. Yeah, yeah. And you Man, guys are- good research, <laughs> It's from 2006, okay? Um, okay? You guys are, they are going crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Did you, were you guys surprised at how much this song just, this is before, this is before proper social media, right? So 2006. It's before Facebook. Yeah. Before This YouTube. is before YouTube, before Facebook. Yeah. Um, like, do you remember the surprise of like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. First, first, well, I didn't know that, and uh, like millions are listening because it was viral or trend before the word viral or trend was yeah. a thing, right? Because uh, there was a website called ArabRap.net. Here it is. <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> How did you find it? <laughs> this, uh, man. Damn. How this did you website... where? Hello, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> oh my God. Bro, what do you really remember? Good. I wanted to ask you, like, what do you remember about this website? Oh, wow. There's a lot of things I remember about this website. This website was the first connector of Arab hip hop before there was any social media. So that website is very important to us as rappers and where rap is today, because that's the place that connected all of us. Literally, this is where we knew. Wow, th this is how we knew that there's hip hop other than us. We, yeah. uh, we thought it's only us. We didn't know there's anything else. And then this website by la launched by someone named Shadi from Nazareth, Palestine. And this is where it was done. Minar Habi was downloaded close to a million times in the first week of release of it to this website. Release means like they just uploaded it. Yeah, they uploaded and, it. And, and, and then we up. just got, yeah. And then we knew that it was downloaded a million and we didn't believe it. And then we realized, no, they, were, they weren't joking. They were real. It was downloaded a million. And then we were surprised because once, then 2003 touring in, that was our first ever tour in Europe. We, I think it was 2003, it was a huge protest. And I think it was for Iraq, maybe 2003. And somebody was passing flyers in the protest with like 150,000 people. And in that flyers, like some French person, the booking agent that was with us running to us and was like, do you know what's, do you know what's written? Here? We're like, no, they're like, this is translation to Miner Habi. For, in French, and they are sharing it all around the protest. And we didn't know it's not by our team. We had nothing to do with it. So we kept learning more and more like how big it is. And that's actually where Arabrab.net is where um, Reem Saloon found about Palestinian hip hop. And she started hitting us all up there. And she said, yeah. hey, I see there's a rapper in Palestine. How can I come and interview you? Yeah. And then this is where she found out about it. And then in 2003, she came, uh, Reem Salom and Ramzi Arraj came with their cameras uh, to visit their families in, in Bejala. And they started documenting us as this is where the Arab net, Arab net is where they found about, found out about uh, the rap in Gaza, how they found out about uh, us the, and the rest. Yeah. Um, well, this is how so I found is, about you too. From um, Slingshot? from airbrat.net yeah and from slingshot 
Yeah. I mean, so, and we didn't know Reem before, but she also did the, the music video for Minor Habi. And then when she interviewed us for the first time in 2003, she was like, by the way, I'm the one that made Minor Habi music video. And we're like, wow, we, we didn't know. Because that music video was going all around schools, yeah. was going all around protests, all over gathering. And we didn't know that she was the one behind it. Oh, I didn't know she was too. Yeah. I mean, Slingshot Hip Hop for me was like a really, really uh, seminal moment because I grew up on on American hip hop, right? Like ingesting it as much as possible. Yeah. And then uh, when Slingshot Hip Hop came out, I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. This is insane. Like I just knew like Lebanese groups. I didn't think that there was like a, a regional thing happening. Um, I just thought they were like local guys, like Axis it and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea that you could go on tour, right? That, yeah. oh my God, like we can, Slingshot like opened, a, it, w it was at Sundance, right? Yeah, so, so like all of a sudden you so, were like touring the world. Yeah. So Slingshot, she started shooting it in 2003. And then 2008, it was done and it was premiered in Sundance. It's an award winning film with over, now she won over 16 awards for that film. Great. Um, and and now uh, because because and then after the touring and after everything, um, we started working together. Me and Reem on films, short films, and we we did some music videos together and other projects. And and now we're married. Actually, she's so so yeah. the the slingshot worked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, did you at any point did you guys stop writing music or were you like? writing music throughout the whole process like the writing. second album like i remember when the second album came out it was like the much awaited second album like yeah <laughs> like did you guys basically stop writing music and then you had to sort of get back into music mo writing mode no. or no no we we just we were just broke and uh, you know it was yeah. uh that was our the thing that we were focused on the most is music uh, yes we toured but you know when um you know a lot, a lot of shows uh it wasn't we weren't good at it as, as from business we were kids you know yeah. i was 14 and the uh, tower was 20. mahmoud was 19. Uh, so we were still yeah, kids, kids and building it yeah so we were building it so it was more financially how um how we could do it um like i remember even like i decided to just learn like we all decided to learn everything about the business because we didn't have money to pay someone to help us with the business so from producing even like i started producing myself uh, i produced some of the songs it sounded terrible but i did produce it uh we recorded recorded on, on in our bedroom even like some of the songs that are released that that were recorded on this like almost like the microphones what do you call those microphone like the web mic those like yeah. gray one for sure like uh, mcdonald's ones back in the day yeah um, the, the janet jackson little <laughs> not, like, no not even that like yeah yeah like the, 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 the gray little one yeah yeah, 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 yeah really, for sure. really bad sound so we recorded a lot of things there produced some of the things uh, tamir was writing all the time mahmoud was writing all the time we were trying to figure out everything i started the, like a self-taught myself a self-taught animator filmmaker like i taught everything so we will just shoot the music videos i'll started animating the lyrics when we were touring so while we're touring, like people would have animation and of the Arabic lyrics we're doing to be in the back, so they understand exactly not just feel us, but also actually literally read every word we're spitting while we're on stage. So yeah. it took us time to build the brand. You know, social media didn't exist yet, right? So we had to do it all um, in in a hustle way. Um, so that's why it took us a long time. And I remember when I started producing, I had these machines, and then I ended up selling. And whatever I was producing with, which was like a keyboard. And it was also because I got the MPC back then, which was the OG producer tool that Trey yeah. used. And uh, uh, and all, all, all this stuff, I sold them to the studio. And this is how we got hours in the studio. We're like, okay, if I give you this, would you give us hours in the studio? They're like, cool. So we, that's how, with the help of other friends too, with money. Uh, and it's a little bit from our money that we already had. That's how we could have made the the next album yeah at the time like uh, between the first album and the second album or the first album and the second and third album i should say 
Do you feel like you could see a Palestinian hip hop scene starting around you? Or was it like, did you feel like you were insp inspiring a generation of new Palestinian artists or was it all happening at the same time, just like say a bit and know you guys released the, uh, the, the first album? Um, no, I, we saw how, we saw how we inspired others. Yeah. But same time, sorry. We saw how we inspired others, but same time it feels like, you know, it's like almost like uh, waves of sure. brains that were like people were also starting without knowing about us. It's not just the people, I don't, I don't want to, like some people started because we inspired them, but a lot of others that started from different places that they didn't even know about, but they just started because hip hop is started becoming a thing, especially if you look after the 2000 when like hip hop started becoming in, in the mainstream, people started knowing about like Eminem, 50 Cent. So those yeah. also were part of the, the, the global scene started inspiring our local scene as well. Um, yeah, but we were definitely um, the, the the main inspiration when it comes to to the region, especially because every even conference or every educational conference or every political party who wanted to host something about talking about like the situation and why you need, we we need to work together, why we need or every activist. Um, uh, oh, Google insan like humanitarian. Uh, Orgs, like human um, rights worker, all these people. Yeah, yeah. The, when they wanted to do things, they would call us to be on stage. So we'll bring the youth because that older generation of education and academia, they didn't know how to bring this youth to talk to them anymore. So they wanted someone to close the gap. And we were that um, that the group that closed the gaps because in dance shows, you would you know, usually in the world, if you go to a hip hop shows, there's not enough like female or there's not enough like older. But if you come to Dam's show in Palestine, there's it's so diverse with ages or the religious or cultures or or you know like you would see seventy years old and a ten years old both together screaming minute happy, which yeah. had never happened before in events uh, locally. So yeah. yes, I see it as inspiring. Uh, hip hop, but also inspiring other things. Speaking about um, women in hip hop, uh, in 2012, Amaisa Dao uh, joined uh, Dam. Um, yep. What's the what's the backstory uh, of how yeah. that happened? We know Amaisa Dao because of, of course, her family and Salim Dao, uh, the actor. Um, yeah. So Amaisa Dao was a fan when she was uh, when she was still a kid. So we also knew her as the fan. Uh, and later on, uh, we really we always wanted like a female voice because we did speak about female rights, but we didn't feel the right to always speak about female rights, but not having any female voice in our group. Yeah. Uh, but and we did work with many, but we never clicked with uh, with any. But then Maisa uh, started at first because she was very young, starting. She started as like a background voice, uh, vocals. And then um, we worked closely together, not just on the before damn stuff. We did Dumia Plastikia with uh, the Dub Key movement. We did uh, the Thawr um, al-Khadra song also together. And that was one like solo projects on the side. Um, and she started like, you know, doing her, her things on guitar. And, and then she, she jumped on stage to be background vocal in 2012. In 2013 is when I moved to the US and we knew that when I moved to the U.S., there's someone that have to fill in, especially for all my part. So all my, because I used to do more melodies and more reggae and more things, so that fit her. And so moved all my verses and all my vocals, everything to Mesa, and then she replaced me at first. Cool. And, and then I moved. And then slowly after 2013, they all did, there was chemistry between the three of them and them and me from the U.S. speaking to the group. Uh, on a daily basis, and then it's organically and slowly just became Maisa is Dam. Awesome. And, to, and then later on to a point where Maisa is not just part of Dam, we wanted Maisa to also be the face of Dam. So that's why you have this cover where you see Maisa in the front and then Talan Mahmoud in the back. Yeah. Uh, and she has some of the really strongest bars in this album, Ben Hano Mena. Just so the comp is like a very strong track that she recorded 
uh, the, the some more spoken word uh, song. But yeah, so that's my sadal and and. So we asked, as part of Chord of Tones, uh, we asked you to pick three three tracks. Um, and one of the tracks you uh, suggested was off this album, and it's uh, yeah. Brooklyn, which is a play on where you're from, um, and Brooklyn. Um, all right, let's listen to a little bit. It's a personal letter to my friends and my family, and it was the 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 shift of that's it. You know what? I'm not doing any more. Damn, actually, this is I'm gonna just little because when I moved in 2013 um, to the U.S., I stayed with them. I would fly back home twice a year and tour in Europe or tour somewhere or go to the studio sometimes. But I wasn't like fully in them because I still was like developing life and as an immigrant in the US from green card to like, you know, started working in film stuff and motion graphics stuff, producing all type of projects to do producing all kind of music or initiatives around music and culture in the US. And then when Ben, ben Hanno Mana album was in work, I flew back for that to record and I actually even like my voice opened the album and then I have a lot of uh, background uh, vocals within the album. I do a lot of hooks in the album, but, uh, but, but with this one, it was like, this is your song, do whatever you want. And I was like, it's going to be a letter for you all. And they didn't even know what I'm doing. And then they just heard it in the studio while I was recording. I didn't even read the lyrics to them. Just went in and I recorded it and everybody was like, fuck his album. <laughs> Uh, so that's why I chose it. I think it's a, the transition of who I am today and what I was like now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Five years after moving to the U.S. when I finally became a green card holder or a citizen, not an alien anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
And then, you know, it was, it was a letter. It was a letter for you family feel like friend. You have, do you feel like you could have said what you needed to say without the protection of the music? Without, what do you mean? Like you said, you didn't even read the lyrics to them before you recorded it. Yeah. It's almost as if the, like the track was shielding you <laughs> like, okay, now I'm safe to say this <laughs> truth. <laughs> No, no, it wasn't, you know, they did tell me Mahmoud and my sister, they're my family, we're, we're yeah. like, you know, I sit by to them, but I'm still in a WhatsApp group with them, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you can't, you can't, I can't escape family, but it just had to, had to do this transition of like, that's it, I'm, it's a mic drop now that I'm going on, which yeah. I think, you know, it's not, it wasn't a surprise to them, it yeah. wasn't a surprise to anyone around me. And they all saw it coming because even before I moved to the US, I was always that guy when coming to the studio without the lyrics ready because I was busy preparing for the show or strategy for marketing or uh, preparing like uh, animations because I would literally be animating all the time it is recording or Mahmoud's recording. And then I write the lyrics and just go in and record, uh, which, yeah. you know, like, but if you look at Tamar Mahmoud, they used to just really focus for daily, every day, write lyrics, every day lyrics and I'm like just busy with like logistics animations music videos so I think it was it was the right move because it made sense I yeah. wasn't stubborn of like no I have to be on stage all the time I was like no nah, it makes sense I'm probably better here let me just focus on it more yeah and that's when I think being on stage as a performing and going to behind the scene or backstage to as a supporter or an amplifier more um, was was a very fading, like a mix, almost fading, fade out. Because I was like music, almost ninety percent and ten percent doing like the other stuff, and then it slowly started like moving up. And then this song was like, no, this is real. I gotta focus here right now. And yeah, yeah, it's intense. It's hard to give up like a very important part of your identity. Yeah, but it's it's still part of my identity. Of course, there was the ups and downs with like yeah. the feelings, especially because, of course, when you move to a whole new country, still you're not allowed to work at first. You're you're just hustling life to figure out life. So of course, like when you know you had something that you established since you were fourteen, so that's sixteen years that I worked on it, and now I just made this big move. So of course, there's a lot of ups and downs to figure things out. But now. Actually, literally exactly in 30 days from today, it will be 10 years uh, since I moved to the U.S. Yeah. And so a lot of figuring things out. And But as, a, as I always say, Liddao is our hustlers. We'll, we always can figure it out. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, let's listen to the second one. Um, and maybe before I, before I queue up the second one, um, your current role right now, like your yeah. main day job, is being the head of the WANA sort of division of Empire Distribution. WANA being West Asian, uh, West Asia, North Africa. Um, so, which means, as far as I think, for what I think it means, is that you basically work with a ton of artists across a very broad geographic region. And help them figure out how to make their music be heard by millions, hopefully billions of people around the world. Is that essentially billions. what you do? Billions. Yeah, it's already billions. Um, yeah, th that's the, the easiest way to put it out. You know, it's the West Asia, North Africa and the diaspora. Uh, even though, you know, it's a diverse cultures and there's a lot of cultures in this region and, and it's very diverse. And but I'm mostly work, working with Arab artists, but there's a lot of a lot of great talent locally and in the diaspora. Yeah, uh, some of it is distributing it. Some of it is uh, distro plus, which is like uh, distributing it, but also supporting the growth with the strategy. But some of them are also um, on a record label deal where it's the more focused, the priority artists, and they're more uh, people that is for the long run big partnership with uh, developing the music, developing the marketing, developing their strategy of their day-to-day -day till they blow up. Yeah. All right, let's 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 listen to the two other songs that you chose. Um, the second one, tell us about... I would rather have this as the third, actually. Let's do the second. Okay, cool. The other one, because it's a good transition. 
in your edit. Yeah. All right. So the second clip that you chose is a song that just came out like days, uh, if not hours ago. No, hours. It just hours came out ago. a few hours ago. Yeah. Okay. So let's listen to, first of all, tell us who this is, what the song is, and then we'll listen to it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to choose uh, I, what I did. The two reasons why I chose this song. The main it's because I didn't want to hurt anyone Why choosing songs. So I said, let me choose the last song which you released. So yeah. this way, that's the reason why I chose it. <laughs> this is uh, being recorded like... on July 17th. <laughs> yes, and the song was released like hours now. ago. Yeah, and that's the reason why I picked it first, because I didn't want to be like picking anyone or showing any favor. Even though that soldier is one of my favorite artists. And this song was released now in a very complicated time for a Sudanese yeah. uh, person. And Soldier is one of the top Sudanese artists, is an amazing lyricist, a very good rapper, and amazing human as well, uh, who picked his bags and left Sudan to Egypt now. And he's starting literally last week. He just started a new life. And the song is... Is, 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 I'm very connected to it as a person who grew up in Palestine and then had to leave. Um, and, and the lyrics are very strong. He's talking to Sudan as a, as a, as a woman that he loved and he's just explaining that I think it's done, like, or we're breaking up almost. Uh, so it's a very emotional song. And, you know, if, if I want to connect it to me personally, it's very, uh, very connected to me, especially because of this shot that you're seeing here. You would see it later. There's like a, the, the, like a kiss al al ard that shows like him just like what he packed to leave, which is if you look at Brooklyn as a song that I that you just played, I'm talking about keratin kull al bet al al hit hatatam bishanta, and that's literally what he did in the video. It's like a suwar al hit hatam kiss, and you see him moving. And here's a, like I don't think he soldier even knows about my song Brooklyn. It's, it's not even connected. I don't know if he knows the song, um, but so yeah, I just felt very connected to it. So I thought, wait, this is like perfect timing, last release, one of my favorite artists, very connected to the story. Let me choose that as the second uh, song. Amazing. All right, let's listen to it. It's a great song. Shabdam 
اديك فرصه تاني ما ظنيت عندي ليك حاجه ما ظنيت اغني ليك تاني ما ظنيت تشوفي وش تاني ما ظنيت اديك فرصه تاني ما ظنيت اغني ليك تاني ما ظنيت عندي ليك حاجه ما ظنيت Man, what the hell? Yeah, نظلم so good. نظلم نظلم اللي بحبنا وبنحب اللي بظلمنا. Fact, it's a bar. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I mean, this is another reason why I'm connected. Connect, even though that it's just got released, but I got very on repeat for me since since he sent it to us before release. And yeah, it's really powerful. I'm, I'm connected to it also because, unfortunately, what you're saying right now for, with a lot of the artists, uh, with a lot of the music that I'm hearing for, that has come from the Legion, a lot of it is about moving out or having a dream or I want to immigrate or which is, it's it's a very, it's very, fortunately, like we're in 2023, but the situation is not as good. I mean, Lebanon, you're in Lebanon, I mean, I mean, I don't know how many people are still in Lebanon anymore because like, a lot of my friends that I know moved out. Yeah. And Ahlami is a song that Leil and uh, Ahlam, a song that uh, Leil and Draganov released, is also about two Moroccan uh, guys that are just planning how to get the fuck out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just like. So, so, so intense. What is your relationship with, like, walk me through what your your connection with Solja is, for example? Like, are they. F- final products being sent to you? Are you sending notes? Are you like, how do you like working with artists? For, for me, as someone that was an artist, I, for my role is to close their gaps, but not to fill up more things on their, uh, on their whatever stressing them out. I don't like, if you are an artist the type of artist that you like to come with final product, but you need support and distribution and marketing, I got you. Let's do that. But if you're an artist that you're, we know you're good, you just need a support with a and r your song. a and mean artist and repertoire, which means like finding your producer, help development, help lyrics, help whatever it needs, or help find your studio and put you in the studio, then we'll do that. So each artist is a different relationship. But if we want to yeah. speak specifically about Soldier, Soldier have an amazing team. They're called uh, Seven Bird. Danny, which is his uh, manager, and uh, Rauf, which is from uh, the Seven Birds team, who's also producing some of his stuff and also managing some of the stuff, and they're also a label as well. Uh, so for for us, when it comes, it's not just about Soldier, it's also about the Soldier team and the, the people around Soldier, the Seven Birds. Uh, they're very smart uh, uh, music business producer. Creatives, visuals, uh, crazy. Visuals, they're very creative. The whole team is very lit. And they're uh, Egyptians, uh, Sudanese. Um, they studied in Malaysia. They studied the music business in Malaysia. And then now they're back in Sudan, Egypt. Now they moved to Egypt. Um, and the relation with them is a, a yeah. long-term partnership of how do we help them build their own empire? Uh, and how do we help their financial wealth, business structure, so like there's budget that's being put in about just producing so they could recoup and start making their own uh, money. And the way we're working with them of, of like, they would call and be like, this is the idea, we have this idea. And I was like, great idea, but here's the suggestions that we have. If you do it one, two, three, it might affect you in four, five, maybe you shift around the strategy. So it's more on how do we just help when and whatever you need, I'll get you. Like. So let's say if uh, one of the teams just hit me up and they need help within management, then I could jump on a call and schedule also a call and bring, and bring to the call uh, Tina Davis. Tina Davis is the president uh, at Empire as a and She's the one that discovered Chris Brown, managed him for 15 years. She's one of the people that probably majority of the labels in the U.S. when it comes to hip hop. She was behind a lot of those from Def Jam mm-hmm. to, to many others. Yeah, uh, so and she's she really cares about this region and she wants to help with with anything. Uh, we ask her to, and then if someone like Soldier's team would want to just jump on a call for consulting or management, we'll just bring her on the call and she just give her suggestions. That's one example. Or if it's an ANR sure, cool. team, I can bring someone from the ANR. If it's a marketing, I can bring the marketing team. Like it's yeah. it's just like how do we help them 
to a point where they could do everything alone with empower and build and grow and grow and grow. And it takes time. Yeah. Because we're not a major label mentality where the way major labels do it is just like, let's throw all this money to make this flash glammed out picture of this artist. And then that artist is, is lost if they leave the ma major label and the major label will own all their masters. And yeah. like, for us, it's not about owning this and for us it's like how do you keep growing that if you're not with us you would still grow later on okay let's do that let's do the the last month the last interlude which i was uh really excited to see um what is this what is the song and why did you choose it i chose it because i needed something fun because i know it's gonna be heavy talking about <laughs> brooklyn, <laughs> brooklyn and i am i was like i gotta be fun and yeah. those two artists are artists that are big priority for us within uh, the team and for me personally as well mm -hmm. uh, michelle tamir who's half arab half latino from saudi arabia lunar who's a palestinian from jordan uh, they both uh, sing in english but they're very representative of their culture uh, yeah. The reason I chose this song, it's mixing, because it's mixing a lot of things that I actually like when it comes to gaming. I think the gaming industry is one of the best and top industries. Like if you look at music, I think music is like way behind gaming. Gaming is like, is more evolved and, and, yeah. and, and cooler in many things, right? Um, and then the reason why I chose it, because it has a lot of funny stories. So I closed the, I closed the partnership with the uh, Gamers 8. Gamers 8 uh, is uh, the biggest um, uh, gamers festival and one of the, I think the, the biggest in the world uh, that takes place in Riyadh. It's happening, it started last week for eight weeks. And this song is the anthem of, uh, of Gamers 8. And it was in partnership with Spotify. So Spotify is supporting the song as well. It came through the Spotify team. They plugged it within uh, Times Square billboard, so it was nice to see in the middle of New York, Times Square billboard, seeing two out of artists just there. Um, and the funny story about the song is um, these artists are so creative and, you know, they both separately follow each other on their Instagram, but they never work together. But I heard it from both artists how much they're fans of each other. So when this opportunity came, and uh, they 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 asked for this artist, two artists. I called them. Uh, Michelle was on his way packing from LA, finished rehearsal, uh, going to LA, to, going to London to start his tour with One Republic. And Lunar just finished his uh, uh, mixing his album, and he was leave, he was from LA going to Boston, and from Boston he was going to Amman, uh, and uh, and I was going to New York for a conference uh, Indie Week in New York. And then I was like, hey, everyone, you turn. We're all going to San Francisco. No one's going home. But <laughs> so like, what's going on? I'm like, okay, we only have literally one day to deliver the song. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, we all flew back to San Francisco to our studios. And in five hours, they wrote, produced, recorded the song. Oh, cool. um, and yeah, the, the, so, and the concept is very connected to what we just talked about earlier about also motivation of being beat up almost by everything and just like in, in a game right too like but life is a game yeah. <laughs> not really but you know what I mean. um but getting beat up getting beat up and then just go strong like and, and keep fighting and that's the song it's it, it is a gaming anthem but it's also a life anthem because it's talking about um even like so, some of the some of the lines are really strong like uh, uh, yeah, he, I'll, I'll fight for us. Yeah, he, I'll, I'll don't yeah. cry. Like I'm here for you. And and then G G G now G G is means in the gaming world, it's like good game. So like when when you win, you know, yeah. like oh yeah, good game, good game. Like I beat you up. Like good game, good game. And then Gina, hi na Gina. No, خلاص, we're not here to kick. Yeah, and don't know the Not here. We're here to win. I love it. They they created a great anthem for we're here to win. All right, let's listen. We're dragging us down, face on the ground. Still, we're so proud. Just look at the crowd. Making some noise, making some sound.
paradise through dirt in our eyes for us. Oh, Echi, I'll try, Echi, I'll fight for us. I love it. Okay, I'm gonna stop just because I want to yeah. save time. I want to get in the last three questions real quick. But the song now is being played ten times every day in the boulevard in Riyadh during the festival and in all those gaming booths or the whole time it's on repeat. And amazing, it's, it's doing very good. Yeah. Okay, last three questions. The first one is: um, You were the music supervisor for Mo, the show on Netflix, um, which is you know. Famously, a the first show to feature a Palestinian lead um, in the states, uh, hugely influential. I think people are going to look back at the show as being a, a sort of a uh, a very a pivotal moment in sort of Arabs in media. Um, what's the story of how you got involved, and how did you think about approaching um, supervising the music uh, for the show? Um, I, I know Mo for a long time, actually, beginning of his career, when he first, uh, well, our first, I think, tour in the U.S., we were booked to do like a lunch for Arab Americans. It was like maybe 20 people in that lunch. And <laughs> sorry, yeah, there was like 20 people that we performed for or something. And then he performed there too. Uh, I think it was like maybe 2006. I don't, I don't remember the exact date. Uh, but very long ago, so, so that was yeah. the first time when we met. We were, you know, still young, and uh, and uh, and during those years, we would see each other. We would run to each other every now and then. Um, and then when I moved to the U.S. and we kept working with each other, I actually designed his uh, animation and the invites of his um, first comedy special. I did the whole like Netflix designs mm. for them and then the animations of all the characters jumping in and all that. It's the whole creative direction with of the tickets. Yeah. Um and we're also talking. rocking a, you're also rocking a Moshe right now. Right. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Representing my friend. No, I I love Mo. I think he, what he did is his great job as a, a starter and then um, you know, the the specials are great and yeah. And hopefully the second season soon after the strike, there's a writer's strike. Soon as the yeah. writer's strike is over, he'll come back to it. But yeah, so while while we're hit, while we're running into each other, he would tell me like I'm writing this script about this and, and he would tell me some of the stories. Um but we never spoke about music supervision, but I was very involved already from the beginning while he was still starting to write before Netflix even picked it up. So cool. uh, and and then when it got to a point where it got picked up, he started talking about music supervision and we started talking about music. I sent him a playlist, I remember. So he just like, while he's writing, he'll have this music in the background as well, introducing him to musicians, to all kind of songs. And then he was like, look, I, I don't think anyone can do this job, but uh, it's just you because you have the my background as an Arab, but also you have the hip hop head, which is the, 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 the story of Mo and the show is very hip hop. The, very the, the way, yeah, the, the way it's filmed, the way it's cut, where it's filmed. The, the, and Mo is very, he's a, he's an Arab, but he's hip hop too, right? Yeah, he's like, he uh, looks like Run DMC in the poster. <laughs> this one, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, we talked. He's like, I don't, I don't think anyone else could do this job except you. Yeah. Would you do it? And I was like, of course, I would love to. I mean, that was a dream to be a music supervisor on a show, even though I did a lot of music, soundtracks, plugged some songs and shows, but I never had a full show and uh, music supervision role. And uh, I learned a lot as, as, uh, as I'm working on it. And, you know, some people think it's like, oh, it's a fun job. You just like go pick song and that's it. No, it was like a lot of work, a lot of clearance, a lot of legal things, a lot of, uh, yeah. you know, I'm glad I had a great team to help with it. Uh, a lot of, um, yeah, it's, it's it's the way I see music 
and shows it's like the spices of the main dish. The music is not the main thing in the show. It's just the fin- the finale thing that we like yeah. added a bit. Yeah, but I really cared about the narrative of the music as well. So there's a lot of the hidden messages within the songs that are that are, that are chosen there. And it's not, they're not there just because of the rhythm, but they're there also, some of them are chosen because of the lyrics. A very good example would be after he gets fired and then he goes to the hookah spot and there's the the, the two friends who are playing backgammon uh, and then they're fighting about the occupation or the whole conversation there. Uh, the song that I chose while he's going into the this um, hookah spot is La Shurb al Bahar. So the whole concept of the song is also about not giving up, about fighting, but also even if the occupation comes in and take Akka, whatever it is, we're going to keep fighting. And Akka is, of course, a historic town, is one of my favorite town in Palestine. And if you have Sur, where everyone jumps from, and also where Napo- Napoleon got defeated, and historically, that's the town that Napoleon got his ass kicked, which we're all proud of, you know? Yeah. So having... Having this song being a song that is playing after getting fired, getting like humiliated or, or the feeling of a failure, going to a conversation where there's two people arguing about uh, occupation and colonialism of Palestine. I thought this is the perfect song sonically, but also narrative wise, it would hit the messages, which I'm a huge fan of like those messages with it. <laughs> with the end things. And, you know, especially because Akka is, is a very... You know, historically, it's, it's a city that now is going through a very strong, or what they call here in the U.S., gentrification, but it's just like this, the, the, another level of colonialization with yeah. um, kicking people out of their houses or, or, or taking people's houses in Akka. And so I, I thought it's the right song. Excellent. So a, lot of, so a lot of those spaces within the show, there's those messages. Amazing. Okay, the last two, the last two tracks. Uh, the last two questions, okay? Yeah. Uh, and I told you this before. If you were to put together a Wu Tang style supergroup of classic Arab artists, who would be in this supergroup? And I told you that I don't like this question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like I the Avengers, the Avengers of, the Avengers, of yeah. classic Arab artists. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, the, the, the typical um, answer probably would be, I mean, you, have, you have to be, you have to have Fairuz there. You know what I mean? Okay. Like you have to have Fairuz. You have to have, on Kulthum, they don't fit much, but it would be good to have uh, both. Um, it's two different genres, but sure. it would be interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, th- th- they don't have to be Arabs, but because they're really loving the mashups that have been coming recently mm. uh, by a lot of the DJs from the region. One of them is like the Jamil, who's killing it with mashups. Yeah. Uh, Jamil is also my brother, by the way. Uh, so some of his mashups is mixing like Beirut with like Tupac or Biggie or like 50 Cent or like things <laughs> like that. It would, it would be interesting to, to have Biggie in the mix because he's a very good storyteller. Yeah. And uh, we as Arabs, you know, our music is very good at storytelling. So having him there, um, I would I would love to have my dad there to um, bring him back. My <laughs> <laughs> Arbaatash came in. My Arbaatash is of it, yeah. Um, a boy kind of drummer or guitarist. Okay. Um, I would love to have him in there in the mix. Um, me. I mean, I want to yeah. be in there. <laughs> you got to be in there. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll start La- the last question is um, put together a Empire playlist. Who should people be listening to? if they have to put together a sort of like a five track uh, playlist. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they <laughs> have 10 track, 15 tracks. <laughs> no, just let, I think the Arab Vibes playlist, uh, there is by Empire, or uh, there is also a profile called Empire Wana. Yeah. yeah. You could also check it out on all streaming platforms, not just on Spotify. 
but also on Apple, on Emmy, YouTube. If you go, you check the playlist. It's there, and the team updates it uh, every week and with a lot of the releases. But I can name some of the stuff that are on there right now. Uh, I'll go from the bottom to the top. I see, yeah. uh, I see that uh, Iraq Forever by Narsi. That track was a surprising track for everyone, but it's so good. Uh, like, um, especially with the visuals. If you know Narsi personally as someone that visited Iraq, I think for the first time, um, and then coming out with this like amazing GQ covers, photos, and content, and then coming out with this song. Um, yeah. it's, it, it was from a personal level, it was very, we, I was very connected to that project. And then right uh, after that, I know this guy, his name is Tamer Nafar. I know his music a bit. Uh, <laughs> the song, the song, I mean, um, is, is a very good song that uh, uh, Tamer is working on a whole new concept there. I, I like Tamer for me is one of the dopest lyricists. Uh, the lyrics there is very strong. The metaphors are amazing. Um, and yeah, and, and then Ghazal from I see Mu'ayyad. Mu'ayyad is a dope, um, a dope MC out of uh, uh, Saudi, and he is actually Mu'ayyad is the most friend in most show. He's the he's a doctor, actor, comedian, um, oh. rapper, and he's the guy that get married at the end of the show. So cool. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So he's there. Lail and Dragon of Lail is, is a dope, dope, dope Moroccan female artist. She's killing it now. I definitely check that Ahlami song. Ghazal, I love Ghazal. I used to be a huge fan of Ghazal. It was a song that was on, uh, on repeat back in the day. And I'm so glad they're back because they took a long break and now they decided to come back. Um, their album, um, uh, the new stuff that they're working on are so good. Naibar Ghouti is... Uh, from uh, Nazareth, Jerusalem, mix of, well, she's a Palestinian, and she just uh, signed to Empire literally like a few weeks ago. And she just released, uh, bef she released recently a song with, Str with Strelix. And uh, that song oh, is cool. uh, Zen. It's, it's killing it. The, the song is so good, which uh, what I like about it is mixing like the folkloric uh, pal tradition, Palestinian uh, songs into a whole new electronic dance pop sound. It's, it's taking our culture in this way. This is something that gets me very excited. Dana Horani killing it now. She also an artist that is uh, just signed with us. Like this is the first release actually with Dana Horani. This is her first release with us. Cool. And inshallah khair also killing it. Leila again and Gigina. So this is this is what you showed me. It's not what I chose. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so hey, man, it's it's honestly. Such an honor to have you on the series. Um, anyone who wants to find you, it's easy to find you online. If you're listening, you can't see the screen. It's uh, Suhail Nafar, S-U-H-E-L-F-N-A-F-A-R. And Empire One is easy to find as well. Man, Why are you not following it? I see follow back. So they're following Afikra, but you're not following one yeah, of them. Yeah, I'm sure. Who yeah, took, who took this? Fake it for the screenshot. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I got everything else right. That one else. Yes, I, uh, that's the only mistake. Man, so honestly, thanks so much. Habib. Shukran, Ilak, man. Shukran. Thank you, everyone, for listening.